This episode is sponsored by Shutterstock.com. With over 20 million high quality stock photos, illustrations, vectors, and video clips, Shutterstock helps you take your creative projects to the next level. For 30% off, head on over to Shutterstock.com and use offer code GAMEBREAKER7. This episode is also brought to you by Audible. For a free 30-day trial and to receive a free audiobook, just head on over to audible.com slash gamebreaker. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome, everybody, to the Game Biz episode one. Sort of. Yes, maybe. It is Monty's Minute rebranded. Yes, this is the show you are looking for. It is now called the Game Biz. Joining me, as always, Mr. Monty Sharma. How are you, sir? I'm doing good, Gary. How are you doing? Good, good, good. We decided to do a rebrand. Too many people uh, didn't understand what the show was, so we went with a different name. The Game Biz... I don't like saying line. Monty's Minute. Yeah, you don't like saying Monty's Minute because you're naming it and you're a humble guy. The Industry yeah. Q&A Show. Hopefully everybody gets it. So if you're just tuning in yeah. and you're wondering what the hell you're watching, well, you're in the right place. It is Monty's Minute. It is still the same show where you guys send us in questions. You can reach Monty at monty at gamebreaker.tv. That is his email address. And send in any questions you got about the industry, whatever you got, all about the industry, the business, um, not just how to get in, but a- anything. Just send it in there and... We take your questions. We answer them here on the show. So, uh, first up uh, for this week, um, you're actually taking a trip really soon. And you're going to be looking for some questions. Yeah, so I'm going to go into Warner Brothers Turbine, um, the guys who do DDO Online, uh, Lotra Online. They did Ashron's Call, and uh, I'm going to sit down with one of their senior guys, as well as a guy I've got a lot of love for, who's had a QA for them, and he has a really interesting perspective on how QA is done, what the sort of career model is there. So we're going to look at both some of the business aspects of what they're doing and strategy and and all of that, and then we'll do a little bit of a deep dive on um, QA and and all of that as we've had a bunch of questions in that area in the past. All right, awesome. So you need questions. Send your questions in uh, to Monty at GameBreaker.tv for Turbine. Obviously, since he's going to Turbo, why don't you make them kind of specific, maybe, about, you know, one of their products or games or what they look for, uh, you know, in certain positions that you may be interested or something like that getting in the the industry. So, uh, Monty at GameBreaker.tv. All right, so first up this week, uh, this one in from Sammy. Sammy says, uh, thanks for all the work you put into the show. Thank you so much for watching the show. Uh, I have an idea for a game. Seems like we get this a lot, Monty. I have an idea for a game, and I am developing the idea with a few friends. What should we do to protect our IP? Okay, different, a little bit of a different question. I'm not trying to get into, you know. It says, well, what should we do to protect our IP? Our, our IP. Uh, do we need to create a company? And any tips for a first-time dev team? That's a great question. I, you know, I think that's a lot of what we've talked about with the people who've uh, sent in questions saying that, hey, I've got an idea. Uh, Sammy's gone ahead and pulled a few friends together and said, all right, let's, let's start something. Now, there's a few things here. Um, protecting your IP is, to a certain extent, easy, to a certain extent, difficult. So um, you, the stuff you create, you put a copyright on, and you've got the ability to chase people down who violate your copyright. Um, if you've got a name that you, know, you particularly like, you probably want to trademark that. Mm-hmm. Um, you can get a lawyer to do it. You can check it out. That's probably three to six hundred dollars to, to to do a trademark thing. Copyright, you just slap on it's copyrighted uh, so and so this date, and, and that's fine. You can defend that. Um, beyond that, you know, I, I wouldn't worry too much about IP protection. So you know, you can go see some IP lawyers, and it'll cost you a bunch of money. Um, and I'm happy to recommend a couple of good ones if you want to spend the money, um, but it won't give you much more protection. And um, in, in the aspect, just starting out, you don't have a lot of cash, 
you're not going to be able to do much even if you spend the money. So to a certain extent, don't sweat it. You know, there was a lot of concern a while ago about uh, copycat games, and mm -hmm. that sort of quieted down as the people who've done them have gotten, you know, beat up, and it ends up being more press for the original idea. That's somebody going what out about saying, does, yeah, um, like, there was like this old, this is like an old school idea, but from the music industry, but bands used to do this all the time, and I'm wondering if it actually holds any weight, is they would record their music, and then they would go and they would mail it to themselves and not open it. And they'd have like the yeah. postmark and the date. Do you think, is there any, is, does that hold any weight if they were to write up sort of like IP documents and sort of like outline what their idea is and then seal it and send it to themselves? That, that used to be the thing for a whole bunch of stuff. If you were going to write something, you'd send it registered mail. Yeah. And so, it, you know, showed up. Does that uh, work? All that is stuff. that like? Um, I don't particularly think you need to do it. Um, you know, it seems like I, an easy just, thing to do, though. Yeah, it's an easy thing to do, but you also have date stamps on everything in your computer these days. You've got you know websites that go live. You've got there's all sorts of things to be able to prove when you did it. And if you're doing that, you're mainly doing that is in a defensive way. So somebody doesn't come up and say, "Hey, you stole my IP. I want to sue you." Um, you know, and you you will get the occasional. Um, oh, I thought of this as well, and you must be taking my idea. And, and people just have to get used to the fact that a lot of people have similar ideas mm -hmm. fairly often. You know, there's only so many of these ideas. And um, if you do something with it, you do something with it. And I think with the game, because you've got the art style, you've got some storyline stuff, all of this stuff sort of makes it different than sort of a core idea. Um, you know, I've known, I, I know there's been some really... Um, difficult, uh, confusing suits in the movie industry of, hey, I had this idea, I sent it to you, and then you guys went and made a movie that was similar. Well, you know, it could be completely unrelated, but um, that's, and, and frankly, that's why a lot of game companies and that will not open your idea, do not want yeah. to hear your idea. But they that never happens that. in Hollywood, so, especially in TV, yeah. never. MTV would never make your show that you pitched them and then they declined and came out with in two months. Never. Yeah, no, MTV. wouldn't happen. Never. So, no. you know, that's one thing. The other thing in the game business, though, is you can just do it. You can get it out. You can do it fairly quickly and, and let it stand on its own. So, nope. um, what about that, the creation of the company? Like, do they, do yeah. they, do, uh, where, where does the, do the, is it really a smart thing? I mean, LLC is, is, fairly cheap to do these days and you can actually do it yourself if you you know can kind of go that right you don't have to hire a lawyer yeah so so there's different levels so you can do what's called a dba doing business as which mm -hmm. means you file no paperwork and um you file everything as personal income tax so that would be you know sort of one person doing it the step past that's a partnership and in a partnership you have rules. So, you know, if you're doing this with a few friends, here's the rules of our partnership. Um, the biggest ones that sort of come up is uh, ownership rights and then how do we um, break up? What happens if one of us wants to leave? And there's a bunch of standard things like a shotgun clause of, you know, if you and I were going to break up and it would be, okay, if you're leaving, either I get to buy your shares at a, mm -hmm. a certain price and if you don't like that price, you can turn around and buy my shares at that price. Um, you know, there's there's a bunch of these mechanisms. A partnership agreement can end up being fairly complex um, and have all sorts of grief associated with it. And again, unless you're making money, and unless you have money, it's not a big concern. Really? Biggest See, I was going to go the opposite way on this because my thought would have been like, okay, if, if you do have a small group of people and if you guys are really, really serious about doing this and you really think that this thing is going to get to market, I personally would want to get the icky stuff out of the way now because when money right. comes into play, that's when everything gets really touchy and everybody kind of has. So it's like, I, I would say if you guys are really serious, my opinion would be get this, get, get some sort of agreement on paper now. Just do it. Hey, and... I agree with that to a certain extent, but I'll tell you the first, I don't know, three companies I set up, um, they just kind of petered out into nothing. 
<laughs> yeah, you do. You do completely run. Yeah, you do run that risk yeah. of just wasting time and money. But in that it, chance that it, it does it, blow up, like you said, money comes in. Everybody right. gets all touchy and weird. And now it's like I did more. You did this. Like you know, you're not pulling your weight. Yeah. I should get sixty. You should get forty. It's like, and that sort of starts to happen. So I'd say you're good doing the DBA until you're getting to the point that you have a, a real product. So a lot of game developers, and, and especially if you're an inexperienced team, which apparently these guys are, um, let's be honest, odds of you getting a product to market are relatively Slim. small. And you, you should do it. You know, would love to see what you do. Tell us more about it. But, you know, lots of these things blow up. But the next stage for that is, you know, as you say, uh, an LLC, uh, what she used to call the Delaware C Corp. And there's two types of corporations you can create. There's um, a C Corp, which is great if you intend to sell your company down the road. Um, essentially, a C Corp retains losses as part of the company's assets. So when you sell it, you're selling the losses along with it. That seems to matter to investors in particular. You can also do an S Corp, which lets you flow the losses back to your personal income tax. So again, if you have income, you're making money, the losses you take by not being able to pay yourself or spending money, all that sort of stuff, can come back and help you on your income tax. Now, when you do an LLC, though, um, the share structure is a big deal. And you know what I advise sort of startups to do is you don't want to issue all of the shares. So you create, let's say you create a million shares. You don't want to turn around and say, okay, there's four of us, so each of us is going to get $250,000 shares. Because exactly to your point, Gary, um, oh, you know, I did this, you went away to do that. What you do is you, you parcel out a small amount of those shares. And then every quarter you get together and you look at it again and you say, okay, um, because we had to eat, you know, you had to take a paying job. Um, and you were working on the ping job and you got money and you did less work than the rest of us did. So, you know, you're going to take a few less shares this quarter. And as you move forward, you know, the share distribution ends up evening out. The, the other thing that tends to happen is that, you know, I look at it sort of the rock band uh, thing is you get together and everything's great. You love making the music. You put something out and it does well and all of a sudden. People start becoming divas and all mm. of that. Um, all of that stuff matters because you're going to be parceling this stuff out and you, you're going to do it over time, which gives you sort of a safe way to do it. Um, when you get to this point, you can form an LLC pretty, as you said, easily, cheaply. You know, um, I think yeah, it doesn't sound like they're probably in the C Corp S, in the C and S Corp range because, and I wouldn't advise it because. We, we are a C, and I have to say, when we went through all that stuff, I mean, you're talking about a lot of time and a lot of effort yeah. and a lot of paperwork. Um, it's gonna, it's annual gonna, paperwork. Yeah, yeah. You're going to go through a lot. It's, it's, it's a lot of your time just getting that stuff done. So it sounds like they're not quite there yet, but I, good to, you know, I, it's good that you're taking a professional route yeah. and kind of looking forward and really want to do this correctly because it's probably the smart thing to do. And I, I would say to them that, you know, wait till you get to an alpha stage before you start thinking about a C Corp. Um, yeah. You know, you guys can talk about it. You can say, yes, this is our intention. Um, but don't, you know, people tend to burn a lot of time and money on stuff. The other reason, though, that you want to form a C Corp or an S Corp is to protect yourselves from liability. And that is, you know, let's say you enter into an agreement with somebody or somebody decides to sue you over IP or whatever else, it isolates you as the individual from that lawsuit. So, but yes, if you lose, they can take everything the company owns, but they can't touch anything you own. And that's different than if it was a partnership or a DBA where they would actually be suing you personally. So, you know, you want to look at that, but um, as my business law professor said to me on the first company I set up and when I was trying to get uh, some legal agreements done, he said, Monty, here's the thing. You're worthless. There's no point in suing you. You have no assets. You know, I, th I think at that time, my biggest asset was I had a sports walker. Uh, that, was, <laughs> that was actually 
books, a sports Walkman, that was the sum total of my heart. That's the sum total that they're going to get out of you and squeeze you, which is the truth for most people, you know. I think right. I think most people are most people want to protect their IP because they think they've got some, you know this idea that's like you know really important and stuff like that. And a lot of the other stuff, like you're saying, is kind of a little bit irrelevant. But really good question, and there's not really one specific answer because it gets super complicated. Maybe we got to yeah. make uh, the game law next. Yeah, talk to uh, talk to some lawyer friends, you know, all that stuff. But as long as you guys talk about it and even write down, hey, here's what we discussed. This is where we're headed. We're in general agreement of this. It'll just make your life easier. Yep. In terms Thanks. of you know, tips Go for a, 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 a new team. Oh um, yes. The biggest thing, absolutely the biggest thing for a new group is scope. Really set yourselves up to do things in small increments. Get a core of something that's good. And I've seen this a bunch of times where they get together, and I'm actually writing a fairly lengthy piece on sort of the stages of development but you know the first stage is this wonderful time where you're excited you've got all these ideas the sky's the limit you're going to do these great things and then you sort of drop off into what i call the valley of doom where you've got to start cutting things and you, you're realizing that no we can't do that we're not good enough to do that um that's really big that's really hard and then people start getting upset because that one was my idea, and if you drop this, then we can't do that. You really, you know, at the beginning, get yourselves wrapped around the fact that you've got to do something small, and all your great ideas will then come after. So what's that kernel of fun at the middle? Build it, play it, and say, hey, that's really fun. Now, we don't have a commercial game yet, but we have something that's fun. Now let's go back to our list of ideas and let's pick the next thing to add and the next thing to add so that bit by bit you actually have something that's you know, relatively done or it's in a beta stage and then you're adding to it rather than you do this grandiose design and you're still in the you know, this, uh, setup screen <laughs> three months later. This is a very hard thing to wrap your head around psychologically when you're in the mix of doing stuff like this, especially with a group because... Everything seems equally as important a lot of the times, and it's really hard to psychologically cut and slash stuff. But yeah, I agree with you. Super important to kind of focus and get your scope down and then learn and figure it out as you grow. So it's def definitely good advice. Uh, thanks for the question, Sammy. That was a really good one. Uh, K Dog. K Dog says, I'm a game design student, and uh, no, I don't need career advice. Okay, well, that's good to know right up front. Uh, it says, I'm looking to hel uh, for help in managing teams. We always start out great, but working in teams ends up being one of the worst things about any course. Any insight for K-Dog about teams? Yeah, and, you know, some of this sort of mirrors um, our last question is, early on when you have a team, uh, you know, in business school, when I took organizational behavior, they used to talk about this process of, Forming, storming, and performing. So when you first get together, everybody likes everybody. Um, you know, you're forming, everybody's happy. Oh, what a great bunch. You remember your first week of college? Yeah, oh, you never met a greater bunch of people. Then you move into the storming phase, and this is generally true of any group ever, where you start to stake out some, you know, turf. And somebody's good at this, and they're bad at that. Uh, they're not as good as it as they thought they were, or as you thought they were. And all of that gets a little bit annoying, and that's where teams typically tend to be ripped. So people sort of start taking that personally, and they get caught up in it. In a, a solid team, like in a business or things like that, you, you sort of push through that, and you get to that performing stage where, okay, I know who you are, I know what you can do, let's get this done, and let's you know, let's put together a plan that understands group people and all of that. Um, typically in school, you don't have enough time to sort of get through all three phases. So, you know, teams end up stuck in that second phase. And, you know, back to the, the, the whole beautiful idea and then going into that valley of doom, especially for a game design student, you guys had all these great ideas, but it's for one class and you've got, you know, five other things to do. And so all those great ideas really mean you can only do a few things. And you got to be aware that people's feelings are going to be hurt because it was their idea or 
you know, they didn't like the idea that got picked as much as another idea. And as long as you guys are aware of it going in and say, okay, look, we're going to do this, this is what's going to happen, then usually you can get, I'll say, reasonable people to understand and to work through in a reasonable fashion. Um, the alternate is what I ended up doing in a course is me and another guy would meet half an hour before the group showed up. We'd figure out what had to be done. And um, when everybody came, we'd let them talk for a while. Then we'd come out with the answer. And we'd assign them chunks of work. And then we'd just do all the work and give them credit for it. Because it beat the hell out of being pissed off that so-and-so was an idiot or this person couldn't write a sentence to save their lives. Um, we still got the same grade. We had less grief. So you can also take that approach. <laughs> All right, next one up. This one from Jason Masters. This is a funny one. He says, uh, no one I know wants to pay for a new console. Are there going to be games for our Xbox 360s in the future? Yeah. Um, you know, this is one of the things a lot of people think of is because I don't want to do it and two or three of my friends don't want to do it. This has to be, you know, a significant trend, and it rarely is. Um, I'm willing to bet by the time Sony and Microsoft get their full marketing hustle going and you start seeing some of the amazing things that they're going to be delivering, a whole bunch of your friends who say, I'm not going to burn money on that, will be running out and buying. Burning money, yep. Yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, so what, what, what will happen is, yes, there's probably a few things still in the pipeline for you know the current gen of consoles. But if you're a, uh, a development house, you want that new rush because the new people, um, th th there's a thing in the console business they call the attachment rate. And it's how many games the average person is going to buy per co type of console. And, um, you know, something that might blow your mind is for, for you know, Xbox, uh, PS3 there, it's kind of like eight so that the average person has bought eight games. Now, for you and probably the people who watch the show and the Game Breaker fans, that's it's like, ridiculous. It's like 68. You know? Right, but that also means a whole bunch of people bought one or two. You know, they bought one mm -hmm. game and that's all they play. So that whole sort of averaging thing um, comes into play. So for the new console, they will at least get that low level of attachment of the guys who are going to buy one, two, or three. They'll buy them right up front. They'll get the console to buy a couple of games, and you get another rush of sales. So everybody's going to switch to the new things. It'll be amazing stuff. You'll love it. You'll buy it. You'll be happy. Write us back. Tell us how it went. All right. We got a few more really good questions here. But first, I want to tell you guys about Audible. You guys have not checked out Audible. We've got a great deal for you. You can try out Audible free for 30 days and get a free audio book. That's right. Just all you got to do is use the URL, audible.com slash gamebreaker. Just go to that URL. Got to use the URL. Sign up, make an account, download the app, put it on your iOS device or your Android, You know, maybe your iPad, wherever you want. I've got mine on both my iPad and my iPhone. Uh, and get to downloading a free book. And this week is one that I am... Super excited to dig into. Monte, I wonder if you've read this because it's a class, it's, it's already being called a sci fi classic. Ready Player One. Yes. You I've have read, read this. You've yeah. read it. Oh, great. So I have yeah. not yet, but I, I, I spent yeah. the other night hanging out with uh, uh, one of our buddies that we both mutual friend mm -hmm. um, and could not stop talking about this book. And it was like, you have to read this uh, or listen to it on Audible because yeah. it's just, it, it's a gamer's dream. Um, mm -hmm. What do you think of it? Did, did you enjoy it? I, I enjoyed it. I thought it was uh, a really good book, a really neat book. It kind of reminded me a little bit of, um, there was another book called uh, Metagame, and uh -huh. it's, it's one of the ones that's, that's pretty cheap. It was self-published. but What is it about Ready Player One? Like, why, why is it, it's got like a lot of nostalgia and gamer-esque kind of themes to it, right? Yeah, and, and, um, and I'm trying to think of ways not to spoil things. It, it just, it reads good. It's interesting. The story really sort of fits the way guys like us think. Um, that's that's the simplest way to put it. You know, so I'll, I'll uh, play a little we're... sample of it here for for everybody. It's also oh, it's, it's narrated by Will Wheaton, so I'm sure most of you guys yeah. out there know who I'm that is. So he's more nerd cred. Channel, Parzival TV, 
Broadcasting obscure eclectic crap. 24-7, 365. Earlier that year, GSS had right added there, a new feature a to nutshell. every Oasis user's account. The POV, Personal Oasis Vid Feed Channel. It allowed anyone who paid a monthly fee to run their own streaming television network. Anyone logged into the simulation could tune in and watch your POV channel from anywhere in the world. Wow, what you sounds, sounds like the real world, doesn't it? Kind of sounds like it, the real world. Have you started to listen to it? Because no. I'm um, okay. It's on my list for this week. I've got it. It's yeah. on my phone. I've just been slammed trying to get a new website out. But this one, like I said, I uh, having a couple of beers the other night, talking to my buddy yeah. about it. He just kept going on and on and on and telling me all the different aspects, like about the virtual worlds and how, mm -hmm. like you know, it's very, it's all MMO kind of related, and yeah. you kind of go down these rabbit holes and stuff. And I was just like, wow, it sounds awesome. And then I came it's over great. here and I was like, it's it's got six thousand six hundred and seventy seven ratings on audible and it's rated four point seven so Which they're saying amazing. that's amazing that that's a great yeah. that's that is amazing sorry what it, were you gonna it, say no no it, it just uh that's amazing in the rating and actually uh will Wheaton, i've got a lot of respect for him you know i i saw him speak at tax time i don't know four or five years ago Mm -hmm. And he told a really good story, and it was neat, and it was about his kids playing with Star Wars figures. Um, but the way he told it and all of that, and I started to read some of his stuff. He's a really neat guy. I got yeah. you know uh, a lot of respect for him, and I'm glad he's doing stuff like that. I wish him the best. Well, check it out. You guys could be downloading Ready Player One as part of your, uh, you know, for your free book from Audible. So go ahead, go on over to audible.com slash gamebreaker, use that URL, sign up, make an account, and uh, download the app and use it free for 30 days. And I can, you know, really suggest you try Ready Player One. And if you like the service, which I'm sure you're going to, it works like a monthly fee. You pay a monthly fee and you get credits towards books every month. I've been a, a subscriber for years and years now. I love it. I always look forward to my credits at the beginning of the month so I can kind of go search and find a new book for the month. So check it out, audible.com slash game breaker. All right, AR. AR has got a question, really simple one. Why aren't there any good educational games? Yeah, you know, that was the great, that still is the great um, question. Of, I, I, you know, you hear this over and over again. My kid plays games like this. This intensely spends this much time, and you talk about... If you spent those eight or ten hours doing something productive and playing a game to save the world yeah. and... You know, we'd be rich. Yeah, we'd um, solve all the world problems. Didn't they try and do that? Wasn't the Obama administration put like something in to try and, like... There's some game to try and, like, you know, something with the oil crisis or something. Yeah. It, it, there's been a bunch of stuff like that, and it's... How do we get the motivation from a game in there? And there, there's a bunch of reasons around this. One is people tend to not understand game design when they're doing this. And you mm. end up with what's called um, chocolate-covered broccoli, yep. the, which I, is, I, you know, here, we took the math and we kind of made it look gamey, but it's right. still math. And right? it's still boring, and it's just, and it's just it, it, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I've had this conversation with other people as well, and, and uh, exactly, every time this happens, the people who are behind or motivated to make this are not game designers, and they, right. it's all about, like, their message, and mm -hmm. I've, and I, and I ta I've talked to some people, like, you, you forget your message, make a good game first, and, like, right. get some game designers, and then we'll figure out how to make your message part of that game, because if your game's not fun and sticky, your educational game sucks. It's just not going to make it. It's not a yep. game. And so it's got to be a game first. The second thing that happens is right now a whole bunch of these things are getting funded by things like that grant from the Obama administration, you know, uh, MacArthur grants, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates grants. Grants tend to have enough money in them to get you to a prototype stage. So you don't get to a finished product. You have no money for marketing. You're understaffed on the business side of the house. So even if you make something good, you've got no way to get it out of the door. You have no way to make money from it. And if you can't make money from it, everybody looks at it and goes, well, educational games, there's, there's no money there. There's no way to do this. Um, and, and that's a real problem. And I'm, I'm hoping, I'm expecting, I do believe in the next few years we will see one of these games sort of be a breakout hit. 
and it are you not seeing money for somebody. are we not seeing like um maybe for the really really young market though is it not working for some companies doing like sort of flash card and very basic things for kids is that not working either well it's working to the extent that parents will buy it very few of them actually do any good and the kids don't much like them i mean one of the ones hmm. that i look at in that area is there's something called native numbers from a company called native brain um and uh, I know these guys, I, I mentored them last year, they've got a really neat thing targeted at young kids to teach the math, and it, it, the first lesson was on the number line, if you remember that. Yeah. Yep. And I'm I'm playing it, and they're talking to me, and I'm still playing it. I'm looking at that, and I'm going, gee, you've managed to create, and they didn't do it with dragons and things bouncing around and all this other stuff. It was just the balance of the activity was solid. And because of that, I was challenged, I was interested, Now I kept doing things. That, that's a really good example. Now, they, they don't have a breakout hit, they're not eating caviar, but mm -hmm. they're in business. Um, the other one to, to, for folks to look at is there's a game called Dragon Box, which teaches algebra. And um, I was talking to some folks who were doing you know, educational games, and this comes up. So I, I looked at it and I go, well, you know, Maybe I'll try it out. Maybe I'll, I'll use it with my son to you know, see if it can help. Well, I've played 30 some levels of this game. <laughs> and it's interesting because it's, it's just a puzzle. I haven't seen a number yet. Um, you're like 20 levels in before you see a variable. And as I'm thinking about it, you know, sort of that meta game, mm -hmm. I see the algebra there, but it's just a game. And I'm figuring wow. out this puzzle. And it's, oh, okay, I got to do this. Now I'm doing this, which is combining eight things I've learned so far, um, and I know how to do this, and I can't wait till they get to the math. But you know, it all. Makes that's a really interesting way to kind of deliver it is like not sort of tricking you a little bit and kind of you know not really hitting you with the the really excruciating hard stuff where you're kind of turned off very quickly. It's interesting. Exactly. We're working on one in the summer program, which is called ZB Zoo, where you're supposed to you. you your biologist, these creatures are discovered, they're coming to your zoo, you have to figure out how to take care of them. And it's a puzzle game. And so, you know, the team had it in their heads from the beginning that we have to build a good puzzle game. If we build a good puzzle game and people play it, they'll develop a system to figure things out about these zebras. And as they do, it actually ends up being the scientific method. And so that comes in on the back side. That becomes something a teacher can bring to you. That can be something that's, you know, additional material that sort of explains what you've done actually has some value and purpose. And, and that, you know, that has its own value. I mean, we do that all the time in games. You know, how do you figure out how to min-max them? Um, gee, what's this do? What's the best combination of hits? All of that sort of stuff is discovery. It's experimentation. It's, you know... That's, that's what it is. So it's, it's great stuff. I hope it will get better. Um, I will tell you, though, that I did some research, and the educational games market in the U.S., uh, actually globally, is smaller than the U.S. luxury toilet paper market. You're too far. That you're is so cream. sad. I shouldn't, that shouldn't yeah. let anybody get them down though. That should almost, hopefully somebody out there gets inspired by that and says, I want to change that because that is yeah. sad. I want to be better than toilet paper. Yes. I want to be better than luxury toilet paper. Wow. I can't believe the market is that small for that. I had yeah. no idea. That is shocking. That is shocking and sad all wrapped up to, into one. Wow. All right. I'm going to move on. Uh, Barry, Barry's got a question says, I just got out of school with the game design degree, but I can't find work. I really need the help as loans are coming up this September, October. And I just have no idea where to look. Do you have any suggestions or tips for me, Barry? Yeah. So, you know, I feel for a lot of the graduates this year, um, this has been a tough year in the game industry. It's, it's sort of at a low point in the cycle. A lot of the companies that are around right now are small, they're tight, it's hard. There's not as many opportunities to break in as there were. Um, I firmly believe it's gonna fix itself over the next 18 months, but that does not help here. So, um, you know, what I would say to anybody who's a recent graduate is 
there's a few things you need to figure out. One is a lot of companies who are looking to hire, they want somebody who's got a little more skill than you have when you come right out of school. So that means somehow you have to keep working on games. Even if you and friends do it as a hobby and you're spending some time still working on games, that matters. Still go to game events, still network, because you will find a path out there. But you got to eat, you got to pay off your loans. Uh, your parents want you the hell out of the house. So, you know, <laughs> this is true. I've heard this from many parents. Uh, my kid's got a degree, why won't he leave? He uh, won't leave. I'm still feeding him. He's, he's a grown he's, adult. He's got a degree. Yeah, get out. So um, the, the thing you need to do there is you have to look at, you know, what I call the shoulder industries. It's what are the things sort of adjacent to game development that have opportunities for you to still work some of your skills, where you're still unique, and you can, you can find work. And so uh, some of the things are, you look at that area of uh, educational games, like we just talked mm -hmm. about. There's a bunch of those guys floating around, and yes, they've got grants, and eh, they're probably not going to make a lot of money. Somebody eventually will. But if you're there and you're working and you're, you're sort of honing your craft, that's good because things will change the market. You've got a place to go. Um, there are lots of simulation stuff going on out there. You know, um, we did a thing last year with uh, University of Massachusetts Medical School, and they just built this $90 million simulation center, went to a conference with them, and all of the simulation stuff there was hardware. You know, they had mannequins and some freakish stuff. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but there wasn't that much software. And, and, you know, when I look at industries, there's sort of this maturity cycle that starts out with hardware, and then everything turns to software. So there's going to be a bunch of software growth on that side. There's places there that need artists, need programmers, need people who can do game design. That matters. The other thing I would really recommend is you go looking in the mobile app market. If you're an artist, you're a programmer, to a certain extent a sound guy, um, you know, you can go in and you sell yourself as a UI, UX designer. So, hey, I can make things look pretty. I can make them look sensible. Um, hey, I can bring in some gamification ideas, all of that sort of stuff. You're relatively unique compared to the people competing for those jobs right now. So you go in, you're going to be different, you're going to be interesting, and you've got a shot of landing something there. So, you know, look broadly, take whatever you can find, Keep your eyes open, keep networking, keep working on games, and come back and make something fun. All right, last up this week, and there's actually, uh, I get this question a lot actually on Twitter. Uh, this one's from Betsy. She says, how do game companies see the Steam Summer Sale? I actually get this one a lot. A lot of, a lot of gamers wonder what kind of a f effect this has on the industry and how much the developers like it or dislike it. So how do they see yeah. it? Well, you know, you're fairly old, Gary. You remember the days of hey, hey. By box software. Uh, you know, uh, EB Games, Babbage's, yeah. 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 Right, back, back in those days, there used to be a cycle. The game had come out, it's 50 bucks. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, then end of the year, there'd be a slim box in the discount bin and be 20 bucks. Then there would be an expansion pack that came out. And then, you know, by the end of that year, you get the original game and the expansion pack in a gold edition. So there was this program sort of obsolescence decline in the game industry. When we get to sort of the digital age and everything's getting pushed on Steam and all of that, they sort of build some of that in, but it's hard to build hype and excitement. So, you know, Christmas time, everybody floods the mall, everybody's buying stuff. How do you build that hype and excitement? Well, mm -hmm. the Steam summer sale. Um, you know, like I had to talk to the team we had because last year we lost, well, I don't know, probably 40 or 50 person hours of work because of the damn sale. Because everybody was jumping on and yelling out what the, you know, the, the current sale was and, and all this stuff. And it's like, all right, well, I know you guys are going to buy. I know you care. You do it at lunchtime. You do it after work. Don't disrupt things. But it got everybody excited. Mm -hmm. And 
everybody that you know I know is draining the cash they have, myself included, in buying a bunch of games. A few things happen there. Once is one of the things is if you're not a regular buyer, you become habituated to buying from Steam. You get that experience. You say, "Well, this is kind of neat. It's easy. I'm getting good stuff. The price is awesome." So you get you get pulled into that. If you're somebody who's a regular buyer, regular player all of a sudden they hit you with a bunch of games. And now you're going to get this adrenaline rush as you play a bunch of different things for a period of time. And then you hit that wall where you've run out of things. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to go back to Steam. You're going to buy something new. It won't be in the middle of the summer sale. There'll be something else going yep. on. You pay I have not price. purchased one game during this round of the Steam summer sale. Mo uh, mainly because most of the stuff on sale is around. I, I own it because I buy a bunch yeah. of games and I, I bought them all in the last sale. So your, your, your scenario is exactly correct. But I have to yeah, imagine that I, companies are in on all of the sales and agree to all of those price cuts. So it's not like Steam is, you know, Valve just coming in and being like, we're just slashing your game down to 15 bucks because we feel like it. No, no, no. The companies are completely in on this and, and are, are writing off on these sales. So I think most of the companies involved absolutely love this Steam summer sale. And Valve's going to the company saying, hey, look, your price is this. If we cut it to here, historically, this is what we've seen in terms of sales. So here's how much money you're going to make. And because like a guy like you who already has all these games, what are you doing when you see one of these games uh, on sale? You're telling all your friends who don't have it. Hey, look, oh, yeah. I play this game. It's awesome. You should get I've it. Also, and so, I've also bought like 10, 12 copies of The Witcher 2 and just gifted them because I'm like, I love yeah. this game so much and it's on sale for $5. Like, I will buy it I, for you. I, I bought that game and it's not a game I typically buy. It's something I've heard a lot of and Okay, I'm interested in it. Five bucks. What the hell? I'll get it. I'll play it, and the, they'll pull me into the the storyline. That's what will happen. So, it seems Summer Sale. They know what the hell they're doing. Best five dollars you could ever spend, Monty. We could do a whole show yeah. on The Witcher Two. It's my favorite. It's good. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll play it. I'll tell you. It's 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 a long one. So I already want to talk about it. It's a long one. It's very intricate. But it's like if you like Game of Thrones, the politics, mm -hmm. the stories, a bunch of families' names that you can't really quite remember because it's really intricate. <laughs> It's a good one. Yeah. Probably one of my favorite companies now. CD Projekt Red. Probably, yeah. I'm I'm coining them as the 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 Bioware saviors since that that mm -hmm. whole thing's a mess. So. Monty Sharma. Follow him on the Twitter at Monster M O N T S T E R twenty seven. That is where you can follow him on Twitter. And don't forget, if you have a question for Monty, you can send it to Monty at GameBreaker TV. That is the email address. You can contact Monty. Uh, you can follow me at Gary Gannon, G A R Y G A W -N, N O N, and of course follow Gamebreaker TV at Gamebreaker TV, and uh, keep a lookout for a brand new third website on the Gamebreaker Media Group list. We've got CubeNation.tv. That's right, CubeNation.tv, an all Cube World site coming to the interwebs very, very soon. I can't uh, say when. I'm hoping for Monday, but who knows if that'll happen. So keep an eye out. Hey, thanks so much for watching the show. Uh, if you guys have friends that you think would like the Game Biz, make sure to tell them about the game show, the Game Biz, right here on GameBreaker.tv. And we'll be back next week with your questions. See you next week. Thanks for watching.